Hello and welcome to the Gender Studies Workshop entitled Attacking Scholarship, Gender Attacking uh, Scholarship, Gender Studies in Post-Soviet Russia. My name is Rochelle Ruthchild, and I am delighted to introduce our panelist for today, our speaker for today, Ella Rossman, who's a doctoral student at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies at University College London and a junior researcher in the project on late Soviet rituals in the Research Center, Human Nature Technology at the University of Tumen. She previously studied and worked as a research assistant and lecturer at the Faculty of Humanities in the Higher School of Economics at Mos in Moscow. Ella participated in Russian independent education and um, worked as a research uh, and, and uh, participated in Russian independent education and gender studies initiatives such as the Free University Moscow and the Anti-University Moscow. Her research is now focused on late Soviet girlhood. She is also interested in the history of gender studies and feminism in Russia. She has written for Medusa, Novaya Gazeta, and Riddle, among other publications. It's an honor to have Ella here. This is one of the great advantages of being able to Zoom around the world. Uh, Ella is presently speaking to us from London. So Ella. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me he here. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, Rachel, thank you. Uh, thanks to Elizabeth Wood. I'm very happy to be here and I have some slides to share. I'll do it now. Yep. So yeah, I'm very happy to be here. It's a big honor for me and I look very much forward to questions and discussion after my talk. And today I will be talking about gender studies in Russia. Uh, in my talk, I'm going to first briefly review the history of gender research in my country, highlighting how the context of its development was changing all the time in the 90s, 2000s, and 2010s. And then I will focus especially on two main questions of my today's talk. The first question is what strategies have gender researchers been using to legitimize their new field in the academia and beyond in Russia? And the second question is how did the challenging context actually shaped, uh, shape the field of gender studies in Russia and how it affected the way they look now? Uh, and here I mean not only institutions, uh, it's obvious that, uh, you know, the persecutions uh, or lack of funding led to the situation when we don't have that much gender uh, research centers anymore. But using the case of women's and gender history in Russia, I will show that the context was shaping the theories, researchers' discussions, uh, their language, and their self-understanding. But I would like to start uh, saying a few words about positioning and my motivation, why I'm interested in this topic and why I find it important and from what perspective am I looking at it. I'm myself a feminist from Russia and I, I'm a PhD student. Uh, now I'm writing my PhD in London, as it was said, uh, and it's about a different topic and not about gender studies in Russia, it's about late Soviet girlhood. But still, I feel that Russian context, Russian history of feminist thought, its development is a big part of my identity as a young scholar, and I feel like I need to be familiar with this whole history. So that was my own motivation to start digging in this topic. And I would say that uh, many other younger researchers who did not create gender studies in Russia in the 90s, but came later, they also have this kind of motivation uh, they are looking for their identity today, and they, uh, for this, they do feminist mapping, they are mapping feminism, gender studies in Russia, and studying or sometimes even kind of inventing the tradition of their research field. So here on the slide, you can see some of the examples of this feminist mapping. For example, on the left side, uh, on the top, it's, uh, um, it's a website which is called... Um, Magical Institute of Gender Research, and uh, this website is uh, collecting, the, the creators of this, this website, they are collecting uh, bibliographies, they are collecting Russian 
uh, publications uh, uh, on gender agenda on different topics like, uh, f- uh, like for example, female poverty in Russia, like reproduction, all these kind of things. On the right side, you can see the webs uh, the screen from the website of feminist trans localities. It's a big, big project um, focusing on the development of feminism in different uh, parts of Russia. Uh, and it's uh, it's connected. It's um, based on this uh, decolonial view on Russian feminism, and uh, it tries to show uh, how uh, different traditions of uh, feminist world war in Russia in different parts of the country. And uh, on the bottom is the project, which is called uh, Genealogies of Feminisms. Uh, and this project was made by several feminist groups and gender researchers groups. And it is, uh, uh, it's a series of interviews with the researchers of the previous generation um, from the 90s, from the 2000s, uh, and also with the feminists of the previous generations. Uh, the young researchers made these interviews. They are all published on the YouTube. You actually can find all of them uh, if you are interested in. So, yeah, I would say that my interest to this topic uh, is, first of all, personal, and it's in line with this new discussions among young scholars, uh, gender scholars in Russia and young feminists in Russia. But also, of course, at the same time, I think that the history of gender studies in Russia is interesting in a broader perspective because it reflects very well the great shifts which are going on in Russian academia, as well as public sphere in the last 30 years. And it can be an exemplary case to show how the research field to its very core uh, could be affected by political persecutions, uh, by political decisions, but also the development of new technologies, new media, new ways of communication. Here on the slide, you can see some pages from the Feminist Translocalities Project uh, Zine. It, you can also find it online. Uh, it was published last year, and uh, I decided to show you these pages because I think they demonstrate how today's Russian feminists and scholars connect their identities with the past of feminist movement and feminist thought in Russia, and also with very local national history, like the history of Tatars, female Muslim reformers at the beginning of the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, or the history of Bashkir national heroes, or the history and writing of activists and publicists from the Committee uh, of Soviet Women, right? The Committee of uh, Soviet Women. I think it's just an interesting example where this search for the identity sometimes may lead. And later, in the end of this presentation, uh, I will return to the projects of new generation of Russian gender scholars and feminist authors, and, and I will talk about them a little bit more. And now let's move to the short history of gender research in Russia. As you may know, in other countries, gender studies began developing in the 1970s, but the Iron Curtain and the censorship of scholarly work delayed this emergence its emergence inside the Soviet Union until the times of glasness, which is the second part of the 1980s. Uh, During this time, scholars who established gender studies in Russia, they gained access to texts in other languages, and they uh, gained access to discussion about gender, um, which was going on abroad, so they began to develop it in Russian. Uh, There were some key points, key dates, of the gender studies development in Russia, in the Soviet Union and in Russia. Uh, For example, uh, in 1989, economists Anastasia Pasadskaya, Natalia Rimashevskaya, and Natalia Zakharova published a paper in the journal Communist uh, titled How We Decide the Women's Question. The authors did not use the concept of gender and they did not say gender studies. Uh, Instead, they suggested the term feminology Uh, But what is important is that they emphasize that interdisciplinary research could truly solve the women's question in the USSR, meaning that this approach uh, would be able to develop effective family policies and solutions to the problems affecting women. Uh, Citing various data, the authors showed that Soviet society, in fact, lagged far behind the gender equality proclaimed by the authorities. And another important date is 1990. In 1990, the Soviet Union got its first 
Research Lab with the word gender in its name. Originally, the lab founded uh, was founded inside the USSR Academy of Sciences, Institute of Social and Economic Problems of Population. And uh, now it's called the Gender Problems Lab. It still operates our days. And uh, the researchers I mentioned, Pasadska, Rimashevska, Zakharova, they all worked in this institute. Uh, and also in 1990, the first independent center for gender studies opened in Soviet Union. It was the Moscow Center for Gender Studies on the left photo. Uh, on the slide, you can see some of the members of uh, this center together. Um, after the fall in so of Soviet Union in the 90s and early 2000s, centers for gender studies started opening throughout Russia. Centers were opened, for example, in Petrozavodsk in 1995, in Ivanova 1996, Tver 1998, Samara, and many, many other cities and towns. Uh, and they also were spreading in the former republics of the USSR. For example, these centers were opened in Minsk, Kharkov, and many other places. Uh, what is important for us is that many of these centers had the status of NGOs, non-profit, non uh, non-governmental organizations. As I understand, uh, their founders wanted to be more independent from the state organizations and from conservative academia. And unfortunately, this independence made them quite vulnerable in the future in the 2010s when Russian government started to tighten control over non-profit organizations. Uh, but 90s and the early 2000s were quite fruitful times for gender studies in Russia. There was funding uh, from abroad, uh, for example, from Ford Foundation, Soros Foundation, MacArthur, Eber Foundation, and democratization was ongoing. So there was no real censorship of this kind of study. At the same time, of course, it was not an easy period too. The science, the research in Russia was in crisis. Uh, scholars were leaving universities and research centers due to the lack of funding. Uh, just a small example from my, from my own family. My grandmother, she worked uh, in the Scientific Research Institute in Zhukovsky. She was a, a physicist. Uh, and in the late 90s, she, uh, she, was made, she was not paid for several months and she left the institute and started working in a call center. And that was not, of course, the unique situation at all. The article of Zoya Khotkina, um, it's one of the founders of gender studies in Russia. She, in 2020, she published an article about the development of Russian gender studies. And in this article, she shares data that according to Russian Ministry of Science, the number of Russian scholars was more than halved in the last decade of the 20th century. By 1998, this number amounted by, uh, to only 42.7% of the 1990 level. So it was not an easy time to develop the whole new field, the whole new discipline. Um, but, uh, and there were more difficulties actually. Uh, some of those who established gender studies in Russia, they were writing and they were saying that gender agenda did not really gain interest both of the state and public. Uh, for example, Anastasia Pasatska, which I already mentioned, uh, she wrote in 1994 that the, polit uh, the politicians in the Yeltsin era quote, considered women traditionally and instrumentally. They were not ready uh, to deal with the women's agenda beyond the conservative view of women as primary mothers and caregivers. And um, uh, at the same time, authorities were opposed to the Soviet project of gender uh, roles. Uh, and conservative notions of family hindered them from critical revaluation of gender and family policies and from calling for gender-based studies. Uh, yeah, here it's necessary to say that at the same time, in the 90s, we actually had a parliamentary fraction, which was called Women of Russia. It was formed in 1994-1995. It had 8% of seats. Uh, but this they had quite, and you see uh, in the middle, uh, on the slide, you can see uh, the photo of the members of this fraction together with Boris Yeltsin. Uh, but at the same time, this fraction, uh, it, it had quite specific agenda. It was aimed mostly at support of families, uh, not, not actively on behalf of women's rights in general. Uh, so, and there were also the opinion, the widespread opinion that actually women were 
freed during socialist times. Uh, so the interest to women's rights was marginal and the social demand for gender studies was consequently very low. In the academia, among colleagues, this demand was also quite low. Many of them did not consider gender studies seriously, although um, it seems to differ a little bit. Uh, it, uh, it very much depends on the discipline because, for example, in sociology, um, I would say that gender studies became a part of the whole discipline much faster than in history or in philology. And it's still there is still um, difference between these disciplines, like in sociology, uh, the scholars are much more open to gender agenda, uh, to this kind of uh, research. So these were the 90s and the 2000s, and the 2010s, they seem to be very different. Um, the changes went in two different directions. The first, the state attitude toward gender studies has become much more intolerant. A so-called conservative uh, turn swept domestic politics, gaining strength in the early 2010s and becoming especially pronounced after Vladimir Putin's address to the Federal Assembly in 2012, when the president advocated a revival of Russian spiritual bonds, skrepy, uh, in new gender and family policies that won the support of uh, religious and ultra-conservative organizations, this manifested as um, authorities' uh, active promotion of traditional values, traditional ценности. At the center of this new vision was the ideal of a heterosexual nuclear um, family with rigid roles for, the husband, for a husband and a wife, uh, as well as hierarchy between the, uh, these two. And uh, of course, this family uh, was a family with children, preferably three or more. Interestingly, the authorities added to this idea the notion that uh, the traditional family should be multi-generational, with grandparents, their children, their grandchildren living all together. And historically, this type of family is even older than nuclear family, uh, which was which is, I would say, mostly promoted by the conservatives today. But in Russia, I think the authorities decided uh, to promote this multi-generational family, also due to lack of housing, the well-known Kvartirny Vapros, which we still have. So yeah, the state endorsed correct values formed in opposition to incorrect values like LGBT rights, abortion, juvenile justice, which is an absolutely different thing in Russia, uh, as well as feminism and everything associated with it, including gender studies. Uh, the conversation about traditional values was subsumed by a panic defense of Russia's sovereignty from Western influence into its domestic affairs, its laws, and even its families. The traditional family became the main symbol of Russia's national values, uh, traditional values, and it was proclaimed that it needed as much protection against invasion as the nation's very borders. So, of course, this all led to the refusal to discuss the gender agenda on the international level. Also, in 2011, uh, Russia refused to join the Council of Europe conversation on preventing and combating violence against women, precisely uh, because the text uh, of all this um, convention, this text uh, contained the word gender, which Moscow argued is too vague a term in addition to being inconsistent with Russian laws. Seven years after uh, the diplomats told the UN Human Rights Council that this convention contradicts Russian principles approach, uh, it's a quote, principled approaches to protecting and promoting traditional morals and family values. So in the 2000s, the state was not ready to fund critical gender studies or to support it in any way. But as for funding, uh, it's not new, right? In the 90s and 2000s, these studies were also funded mostly not by the state. The thing is that in the 2010s, the authorities also started controlling funding of this kind of studies from abroad. Uh, the 2012 law on foreign ages subjected nonprofit groups to crippling filed, filing requ uh, requirements and forced this organization to mark all their content with menacing warnings. Uh, and the slightest mistake was followed by a huge penalty and file. 
So centers for gender studies, as I said, many of them were NGOs, faced a difficult choice of how to continue their work. And um, as you may know, this, uh, this whole, uh, this whole uh, law on the foreign agents evolved since 2012. And today it was changed several times. And today, uh, even those organizations which are not officially registered can be called foreign agents, but also even individual citizens can be called, can be marked uh, as foreign agents. Uh, and to become a foreign agent, you have to do two things, uh, to deliver money from abroad, and to be involved in the political activities which are determined extremely broadly. For example, I will uh, talk about this a little bit later, but Ivanova Center for Gender Studies, it was, a, it was proclaimed, it has now a status of a foreign agent because their leader, Olga Schnirova, she was, uh, it's uh, an official explanation, she was reposting link to uh, some petition in her, in her own social media, not in the social media of the center and she was also planning to take part in local elections in Ivanova and they were also receiving money from abroad. What is important, um, another important law uh, for the development of the whole gender studies in Russia is the law on the propaganda of non-traditional values among minors which was established in 2013. Uh, the law makes problematic the implementing of gender agenda in the universities because, as you may know, Russian students, they uh, graduate high school at the age of 17 mostly, and gap year is not really common among, among uh, Russians. So there are many minors, they go to universities after the school, and there are many minors in the university, and you can't spread non-traditional values among them. And non-traditional values, again, is quite a vague term so you don't really know what is non like what can be called non-traditional is it only about lgbt or it's about something else like just critical approach to family the, the critical discussion about families and so on and i would like to underline here that all these laws i mentioned the way they are written make them extremely vague in inconsistent so they can be used against any unfavorable organization or person. And that makes these laws not only conservative, like the law of non-traditional values sounds like a conservative law, but that makes them also repressive. So they are used as the tools for repressions, repressions and censorship now. Yeah, so here you uh, can see a map uh, which shows what happened with the gender studies institutions in the 2010s. I would like to thank uh, Arina Istomina, an activist and a designer from Russia, for this visualization of information I gained. Uh, you may see that many of the centers uh, of gender research, which were opened in the 90s and uh, 2000s, they were closed in 2010s. Uh, Saratov Center for Social Policy and Gender Studies, Samara Center for Gender Studies, they were designated as foreign agents uh, in 2015, and they were liquidated by their leaders. Uh, Ivanova Center for Gender Studies, by the way, also became a foreign agent this year, but uh, its head, Olga Schnirova, she's going to fight for it, so it's not closed yet. Uh, and let's hope it will be, it will continue uh, working. Um, the center of Ra in Rostov on Don, it was actually created by an MA student, Anna Dvornichenko, together with other students and some professors uh, of her university, Yuzhny Federal University. Uh, and Anna Dvornichenko, she had to fled Russia for the persecution from the local center for combating extremism. So she was organized, she organized several events in her center about LGBT rights, about transgender transgender people, transsexuality, all these kind of things. And uh, from her words, she was uh, threatened. Uh, she had a choice to face a case for extremism uh, or to leave. So now she's in Netherlands and uh, the, the center, which, is which was called Eva and Yasin, it's not uh, working anymore. And some other centers were also close to the threats from Organi, from official organizations, but I can't share all the information I gained. Um, and I would like to add that even if St. Petersburg or Moscow, they are green on this map, uh, actually there are some centers and laboratories in these cities. Uh, mostly they are on the base of 
universities. But the first center, the Moscow Center for Gender Studies, uh, it was also closed in 2015. And uh, also the first St. Petersburg Center for Gender Studies, which was opened in 1992, was also closed. So, um, and these, these centers were the leaders in this sphere. They were very important. Uh, and the common feature of the centers uh, which remained is that they all work on the base of universities and it somehow protects them. Uh, although many scholars inside universities, inside Russian academia are skeptical or even oppose gender studies, and sometimes they act as gatekeepers, they don't let gender studies really develop in the universities and research institutes, for example, they don't let PhD students write uh, dissertations with the word gender in them. But still, uh, these centers, these laboratories, which are based on the uh, universities and established uh, mostly state institutions, they seem to have some more protection than those which, were, which worked as NGOs and still working. The good news is that despite the state's turn towards traditional warriors, uh, the society seems to go in a different direction, at least a part of the society. The 2010s became a decade of development of the new wave of Russian feminism. Um, there were many, actually, I would say there, are, there were a bunch of reasons for this development. Uh, the feminist movement itself became a reaction to the conservative rhetorics of the government, but also it was shaped by the international feminist campaigns, uh, the new feminist movements like the campaign Me Too and discussion about high profile cases of sexual harassment, like in Hollywood and other places. But also in as you know, in 2012, Pussy Riot's action in the Cathedral of Christ of the Savior, it seems to fuel interest uh, in feminists. Since feminist uh, activists who were, uh, who were tried for insulting the feelings of believers, they positioned themselves as feminists and they were quite open about it. Uh, so anyway, the new feminist movement is ongoing. Uh, and I think uh, from information which I gained from the data is quite huge. I know about the existence uh, of at least 45 grassroots feminist organizations throughout Russia now. Uh, it's like the data I collected in November. Uh, and the gender agenda is actively discussed in social networks and media, and even in those media which has never been, uh, which has never written about gender before, uh, feminism is in the theater, uh, we have a new wave of feminist literature, we have feminist arts, and this all of course raises interest in gender studies. Um, and I would say that there is much more demand from the society to these kind of studies now. Uh, on the slide, you can see some of the photos from the feminist demonstrations. Uh, on the bottom, it's the demonstration in Novosibirsk. On the top, it's, uh, it's Moscow. Uh, you also may see the, uh, on the bottom the screen from the Lentaru uh, online newspaper. It's, this newspaper has never written about feminism before, but now it's publishing, it publishes guides on contemporary Russian feminism, right? And uh, on the top, there is a book about feminist poetry, new feminist poetry in Russia. And again, it's published by the uh, online magazine, which is, uh, which is writing about charity, NGOs, and it's not uh, focused on feminist agenda, and it's not focused on literature itself, but they decided to publish a book about feminist poetry because it's something which is really discussed and uh, um, seems to be topical, right? Uh, so these discussions, they really view gender studies uh, in Russia. Students, uh, they really want to discuss gender studies. They demand it in the universities. Uh, galleries of contemporary art invite gender scholars to organize reading groups, seminars, and lectures. And this is, of course, a good thing. So now I would like to move to the case study. Uh, and this part of my uh, presentation is based on my article, which came out just a week ago uh, in the Berichte zur Wissenschaftsgeschichte Journal. It's actually a German journal on uh, 
history of science, but they have a special issue on academic authority in Eastern Europe. And this issue is in English. My article is in this issue. Uh, in my article, I'm writing about women's and gender history in Russia. Uh, the main professional organization for researchers in women's and gender history in my country is Russian Associations of Researchers in Women's History, RAIJI. Uh, RAIJI was established in 2002. At least the head of the, uh, of the association announced it its establishment in 2002, but it was registered officially by the Russian Ministry of Justice only in 2008 as an interregional public organization. Since the very beginning, until now, the head of this association has been Natalia Pushkarova. You can see her photo on the slide. Uh, she's a crucial figure in the development of uh, women's and in gender history in Russia. Uh, Pushkarova, according to one of her interviews on the Gorky portal, uh, she began writing text on women's history in the late 70s, unaware that she was actually doing women's and gender history. Uh, she did not know that this field existed, but just initiated, intuitively, she chose to write about everyday life of women in medieval Russia. Uh, and in the 80s, she had an opportunity to familiarize herself with foreign literature and to do even internships abroad. So she got familiar with the whole field. And in the 90s, she started promoting this field in Russia. I would say that Raiji is quite centered around the leader, Pushkarova. Uh, she essentially remains the face of this association. Um, and Raiji now functions as a Russian committee for the International Federation for Research in Women's History. And Pushkarova is the president of National Committee of Russia uh, in, this, in this federation. Uh, but of course, there are other scholars who were uh, board members of this association at different periods, and were, they were actively involved in the work of Raiji, like Olga Shnirova from Ivanova Center Gen of Gender History, uh, of Gender Studies, sorry, Mariana Muraviova, Valentina Uspenska, Anna Belova, Natalia Mitsuk, and many, many others. And today, Raiji activities are mainly focused on organizing a large annual conference uh, that has been held without interruption since 2008. Uh, they publish a yearly collection of conference proceedings after every conference. Uh, and judging from the proceedings, more than 350 people could participate in the Raiji conference. So there were really big, uh, really huge conferences moving all the time. Uh, every day, every year, these conferences took, uh, took part in a different city or town. Uh, so I would say that Raiji conferences were undoubt undoubtedly the main research event on women's and gender history in Russia, and still they are. Uh, and Raiji itself can be called the main actor promoting women's and gender history in Russia. And taking it all into consideration, I decided that analyzing the Raiji conference proceeding would be legit if I need to understand the ways Russian women's and gender historians legitimize their field, legitimize their field in, in our country. So this is the table from my article. Uh, here you can see the list uh, of the proceedings I analyzed. Some, uh, some of them were in two or three volumes, so altogether I analyzed 20 four volumes of proceedings published between 2008 and 2019. Uh, and uh, proceedings, they contain of short up to five pages articles based on the conference presentations. And since the third conference, the proceedings have included a short introduction, usually written by Pushkarova herself, uh, sometimes in collaboration with other uh, researchers, with, uh, with the colleagues. And as you may see from the table, uh, conferences were quite, um, uh, their, titles, uh, their titles are quite broad uh, and inclusive. Uh, for example, I mean, here it's like women and men in the context of historical change, uh, 2012 conference, uh, women and women's movement for peace and against wars and military conflicts in 2015. So very broad inclusive uh, titles. Uh, and I would like to say that these titles, they allowed 
uh, for representation of a wide variety of historical periods, as well as discussions about the modern state of affairs on these conferences. And at the same time, it must be said that each conference also admitted presentations on topics which did not correspond to the main theme. So it allowed uh, the number of participants to expand almost uh, unlimitedly. And in my analysis of these proceedings, um, on the on the pictures you can see you can just see how these proceedings looked like, um, just some of their covers. In my analysis of proceedings, I use the field theory of French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, and especially his 1976 article on the academic field. I find this analytical approach particularly useful for my case. Uh, Bourdieu was writing about individual and collective. Ideologic, ideological strategies is his term, implemented by researchers, for example, by protagonists of a new field within a certain academic context. Budio's methodology offered a particular asset for describing my case. It shows how the agents of a new discipline brought from abroad and developed in unfavorable conditions legitimized the ideas, how they used to do this. Uh, Bourdieu's theoreticizing allows me to understand how women's and gender history matters among strategies of external and internal legitimization within and outside of the field of social sciences on the way to the scientific authority. Scientific authority is again the term of Bourdieu. And I think he's the frame, uh, Bourdieu's frame, it also allows us to describe how this mandering between strategies shaped the whole field of gender and women's history to its very core in Russia. So yeah, I analyzed 24 volumes of these proceedings and I identified five main strategies of legitimization of women's and gender history in Russia. You may, you may see them on the slide, uh, all these strategies. And I mean, they speak for themselves, but I will shortly uh, make short remarks about them and then unpack a couple of these uh, uh, strategies appear to scale for geography means that the authors of the introductions they were underlining all the times and also authors of the articles in the proceedings they were underlying all the time that interest to women's history is huge in Russia that scholars all over the country are involved and this is just a big phenomena that you just can't ignore anymore. Appeal to connection with the generalized West means that the authors they were underlining that the field came from the West, uh, that it's interesting for the Western scholars and uh, this was used as an org argument as a, to show that it's something important that again you have you can't ignore this field anymore and attempt to ascertain the political significance of women's and gender history means that scholars were underlining that gender studies all in all and gender history in particular is something potentially valuable for the state for the authorities for the civil society for everyone and again and uh, finally attempt to show how the field um, is connected with the classical heritage of the humanities and social scientists. I think it speaks for itself. Something which has a long history seems to be more legit and for people, right? Uh, and uh, women's and gender scholars, they were also trying to show that they have this tradition behind them. And now I will unpack a couple of these strategies to show how they shaped the field, right? How the way scholars were trying to negotiate with the other uh, colleagues like researchers how they tried to um, to present themselves uh, in the uh, in the in Russian academia how they shaped uh, their own discipline uh, the first strategy, the appeal to scale, relates to the size of the proceedings and conferences. Each issue holds more than 100 published articles, and sometimes, as I said, it's more than 350 even. And introdu introductions to these proceedings 
constantly emphasizes how large the conference were. Uh, this is a quote from one of the proceedings. The uniqueness of Raiji conferences lies in its enormous scale. Therefore, it seems that the organizers were trying to expand the number of participants to demonstrate uh, that hundreds of specialists in Russia were involved in women's and gender history and to show that scholars connected with Raiji works, they work at all major universities. Uh, they also tried to demonstrate the broad geography of the conference um, in every way possible, the second strategy, right? Um, this was manifested in the fact that the conference was, uh, they, it moved from the city to another uh, every year, as well, um, uh, as, well as um, uh, it was also expressed in the proceedings introductions, that it, it, it was accentuated that uh, the number of scholars from different cities who present their uh, results of their research on the, at the conference is huge. Um, so how this attempt to show how huge the conference uh, is, how huge this interest in women and gender history is, how it, uh, what did it lead, lead to? How it shaped the discipline itself? Um, I would say that as a result of this attempt, presentations at the conference and therefore text in the proceedings are thus truly diverse in topics, method and language. In a single collection, uh, one can find articles about ancient Roman literature, British suffragism, the history of female education in Komi Republic, and women trafficking in, uh, for example, modern South Korea. There were also notable examples of work that can hardly, hardly be classified even as research. For example, in one of the proceedings, I found a kind of manifesto advocating the return of the traditional road division in the family in modern Chechnya. And in another proceedings, I found an essay about how wives and mothers-in-laws dominate Russian families and oppress men in these families. Uh, so history uh, of family, history of childhood, history of aging, even history of animals, and even those texts which are not, it's not history at all, right? It's kind of manifestos, essays, kind of columns. Um, so every type of social history and every type of discussion about gender, family, and all these uh, all these things uh, could be included in the women's history according to these proceedings. Um, ultimately, an appeal to include feminist and non-feminist scholars opened the volumes to essentialist and anti-feminist articles as well. Uh, in 2016's proceedings, I, for example, found uh, an article where teachers and students uh, they were writing about their collaboration uh, on a pro-life pro anti-abortion video project with and of course this abortion uh, this this project they described in their short article had extremely essential attitudes so as a result women's and gender history in these proceedings seems like a vague, all-encompassing field quite contrary to the vision held by its creators, right? Uh, furthermore, the connection with the feminism from which the research field originated faded at all, and the, the whole field in these proceedings, at least, seems very depoliticized, and the question of power relation remained trivialized in this, in this text. So this is one of the negative effects of this legitimation, leg, legitimization strategy. And another, is, uh, another negative effect is uh, the lack of development of theoretical language of discipline in these proceedings. Uh, for instance, in the conference proceedings, the word gender was used to mark everything related to women, family, social history, and in some cases, uh, it was used as a synonym for the word sex. So yeah, um, the way the way these scholars try to negotiate with other scholars to position themselves influenced very much their theoretical language of the discipline uh, and the whole field 
And here I would like to underline that I'm trying to say, I'm not trying to say that scholars did something wrong with their field. I don't want to sound like that, okay? Uh, I know that they are great people. Uh, I'm familiar with some of them and they established the whole new field in extremely unfavorable conditions. So I'm just showing uh, like what it cost, right? How the context affected the discipline. Uh, and I think this effect is, is huge. And one more thing, I think it would be the last uh, thing I would like to, uh, to talk about in this presentation. Uh, the last few years have eliminated one new strategy for legitimizing women's and gender history and gender studies all in all in Russia. While Raiji approach favored development within the scholarly sphere, a new generation of Russian women's and gender historians and gender researchers, again, all in all, they choose a slightly different strategy to legitimize their studies, one closely connected to the changing medial position of feminism. It points to an important change in both the relation between the inside and outside of academia and the role media play in the process of building and transferring academic authority. Uh, as I said, galvanized by the pussy riot actions at the beginning of 2010s, a new wave of Russian feminist movement is developing now in the country and interest in gender issues is burgeoning in Russian society um, as are popular blogs on feminist issues. For example, just a couple of examples, Nika Vodwood, the well-known Russian feminist YouTube blogger, she has half a million subscribers. Uh, Sasha Mitroshin and Instagram feminist blogger. She has three, I think now more than three million subscribers. So, and there are many, many others, less popular, but still active, uh, actively promoting gender research, gender agenda uh, in the social media. Uh, and of course they are writing not only about political issues like women's rights, uh, like, uh, policy, family policy in Russia, they are writing also about gender research. Some of these people organize reading groups, educational events on gender studies, uh, including women's and gender history. For example, talking about gender and women history, we have a kind of new annual campaign in Russia, new tradition, which is called September Week of Women's History, or Sneži, sounds like snow, sneg in Russian. So it's very, it's kind of very Russian, Russian naming. Uh, and um, this campaign uh, has been gaining more and more audience over the last year. So in 2021, for example, uh, in September, right, it was held in four cities across Russia. It's St. Petersburg, Tomsk, Novosibirsk, and Chelyabinsk. Uh, the whole campaign started in St. Petersburg, but other cities, uh, activists from other places, they started joining. And on the right side, on the, on the slide, you can see the uh, Instagram by St. Petersburg, team of Sneži. They organized not only events, but they also made their own Instagram where they posted about women in Russian history and history of feminism. So it's like all, uh, uh, it's all also uh, promoted in social media, right? And I would say that new generation of gender historians is more likely to come to research from grassroots activism and pro-feminist circle. So cause uh, having learning about this agenda from media social media also, feminist events and uh, social networks, rather than from within academia. And young researchers like Alexandra Talavir, Ira Raldugina, Anna Sidarevich, Anna Khodreva and others, um, so they came uh, to women's history and queer history also from activism and with an uh, inextricable connection with it. And they are not only writing their PhDs, uh, most of them, I think all of them are writing their PhDs nowadays, but they also publish academic articles uh, and at the same time, they uh, also maintain blogs, write articles for the media, organize educational events, collaborate with even political parties. So they are like promoting their studies outside of academia very, very actively. So for example, on this slide, you can see uh, on the top, uh, in the middle, it's um, 
бессмертный пол, it's called by the бессмертный пол, right, but it's like, uh, uh, like a game of, uh, game of words. Um, it's a telegram channel by Alexandra Talavir, a gender historian from Central European University. Uh, she's writing her PhD in Central European University, but she's uh, originally from Russia. And she's uh, in her channel, it's kind of blog, she's posting some archival materials, but also some articles, some uh, popular texts about what she's doing. And on the top, you can see the podcast by Anna Sidarevich and others. Anna Sidarevich, she's writing her PhD about uh, late Soviet dissident feminism uh, in France. She's writing her PhD in France, but she also uh, she also she is also doing a podcast uh, which is called Propaganda Feminism, uh, and this podcast is about feminism, but also uh, fem- history of feminist movement and all these kind of things. So yeah, while doing research, um, some of these uh, young scholars, they keep in touch with activist circles and they legitimize their field of research for links to activism, independent initiatives, media, blogs, where they share the results uh, of their research to the general public uh, and assert their expert position. Um, I would say that in the conditions when gender research is not still really funded or supported uh, by the colleagues. Also, uh, this kind of uh, assertion of one's authority and gathering of social capital is like one of the few variants how you can do this in Russia. And it's also interesting to think about it from the Bourdieu perspective, because in his another book on television, Pierre Bourdieu mentioned similar processes in his description of the influence of television journalists on the field of science, he showed that once intellectual began to be invited into TV shows, it was not the most powerful, but also the most popular scholars who started building academic careers. Previously, the only way for a scholar to legitimize his own research has been to prove its value to colleagues, right? But since then, a workaround has appeared. Careers can be built uh, through popularity with an audience that may not really understand scientific work. And in Bourdieu's assessment, a scientist who gains popularity in the media can later use it to manipulate the university community. Uh, Bourdieu held a negative assessment uh, of the described processes. He believed that intellectuals should not appear on TV, even if he actually did it himself. Uh, and he saw it... Um, uh, he saw that um, he seen he, he thought that the autonomy of the field of science uh, was both a value and condition necessary for the production of new knowledge. Uh, however, I think that the example of women's and gender history and gender research, all in all, in contemporary Russia, show that even in in the ideologically unfavorable context of the conservative term, the scheme condoned by Bourdieu can be a basis for scientific innovation, right? The evolution of gender studies in Russia in the context of digital age is hardly fully described, but it remains an interesting topic for further analysis. And uh, of course, it's especially interesting for me to trace how this new strategy of legitimization uh, and uh, creating a space for research innovations, how it will affect the field of gender studies in Russia. And the last thing I would like to show you, again, the map uh, we created with Arina Istomina. It's a map of contemporary gender studies, educational and research initiatives, the grassroots ones, right? Uh, As you may see, there are many of them in different uh, cities and in some cities and towns, there are more than one. There must be also Chilabinsk on the map. I just forgot to add it, sorry. Uh, And uh, almost, All of these initiatives, they are also present on social media. That's how I found them through my own context uh, among feminists and scholars, but also through social media. And these initiatives, which are listed here, they're extremely different. Uh, They are different in sizes. They are different politically. For example, Freya Frauen is a Marxist reading group, but Moscow Film Fest is mostly about um, 
it's about different things, but it's also very much about women in business uh, and all this uh, <clears throat> kind of more, I would say they have this more neoliberal approach to feminism. Uh, this these groups are very different thematically. Um, so they concentrate on different things. As I said, Snezhi is gender and women's history. Tra feminist translocalities projects, it's like this decolonial approach to the history of feminism. Um, Frau Fra in its Marxist feminist theory. Film talks, it's feminist philosophy and theory. So all kinds of things. What unites them is that they are not formalized at all. So they are not registered as NGOs or any kind of public organization. And um, I know that there was a very interesting talk by Dr. Elizabeth Plantan in Garvard. Uh, it's also on the Davis Center YouTube, uh, where she was talking about environmental activism. And she was showing how state is pushing activists not to register, not to formalize, not to register their own organization because mm, it was easy now it's easy to persecute organizations which are registered somehow, which are like, uh, so the activists, they don't do this. They, uh, they, stay, they stay unformalized. I would say that in feminist, in feminist activism, the same uh, situation, have, uh, we have the same situation. And in this education and new wave of uh, grassroots gender studies, movement it's uh, it's the same so these organizations um they are not registered and i would say that's such a variety that looks impressive for me and encouraging but i'm not really sure what will happen with these initiatives next right uh, first they don't have funding really they are very unstable uh, some of them uh, appear others disappear and this can all all this map can change in a year uh, but also this year we have a new law, uh, which is called the new uh, the law Zakon a Prosvetitelskodetnosti, the so-called Enlightenment Activities Law. It's actually it was adopted this year. It's actually the amendments to the law of education, and as you may know, there is licensed education in Russia, and there are all kinds of things like lecture series, reading groups, discussions, which can be called enlightenment activities. We still we still use this word, enlightenment, prasvishenia. Uh, so the latter, the enlightenment activities, they are not controlled by the state, but it seems that now authorities, they are trying to introduce this kind of control. And as the authors of the law wrote in the explanatory note, uh, the new bill, the new law must be adopted since without it, Anti, it's quote, anti-Russian forces can practically freely conduct a wide range of propaganda activities among school children and students. So this rhetoric is kind of, kind of familiar to us, right? And uh, at the same time, with this law, with this, uh, with these new ideas of controlling uh, enlightenment in Russia, uh, the authorities tried to resurrect the Znania society, общество Знания, the Soviet one, right? Uh, 18 billions of rubles uh, will be invested in uh, its revival in the next, in the near future. And it seems that the authorities, they try to control the public education activities to censure them and at the same time to promote politically correct enlightenment, right, among youth. Uh, again, this new law is extremely ambiguous, so we don't know how it's going to work and how it will affect, for instance, these educational activities, these educational organizations, um, independent initiatives, and how it will affect gender studies. And now this law is kind of sleeping, so it's not, uh, it's not used, but it seems that in future it, it will happen. And so, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure about the future of all this grassroots gender education, gender research uh, but now we have uh, we have kind of huge movement with many uh, organizations doing it so thank you very much uh, sorry if my presentation was too long yeah uh, maybe not and i'm ready for the questions i'm ready for the discussions um, i would love to to discuss my material with you
Thank you, Ella. That was a great question. Good, interesting questions. And I'm going to take the uh, prerogative of the chair, however, uh, before I get to the other questions. Uh, and my question, actually, it's kind of two parts. Uh, I note that uh, the use of the word feminism has really changed from uh, when the historian Linda Edmondson said in the early days, post-Soviet days, that feminism was the one word that was not adopted in a positive way, one of the one English word that was not adopted in a positive way in Russia and that it had all kinds of negative connotations. And now I see that uh, it, at least in terms of the opposition, it's, uh, of, it's seen much more positively as an oppositional word. Um, the, uh, I note that some of the strategies that are being used now are actually strategies that were used under the czar. Uh, early feminist organizations, a number of them also did not register as official organizations, but operated under the radar or on the periphery. Um, so I'm wondering if there's been any connection. Uh, you did talk about Raji, of course, uh, between uh, the uh, or interest in the history of feminist organizations in czarist Russia, how much, uh, and also the feminism uh, that emerged in the Soviet period, for example, the Women in Earth, Tatiana Mamonova, the early uh, autonomous feminists who emerged, whether there's connections uh, made among, the, uh, with those, with that past uh, in contemporary Russia. Thank you very much for an interesting question. Um, yeah, I would say that feminism now is uh, much less stigmatized word in Russia. And I mean, I know that uh, in the 90s, many feminists, they avoid to call themselves feminists. They were like, they were saying that we are doing women's rights. We are like concentrated on women's agenda, but the feminism was a quite um, problematic term. But now, yes, uh, these uh, researches I I was talking about and these initiatives, uh, their creators call themselves feminists. There is no problem about it. And as for the connection with the Tsar times, yeah, I actually, I was I was reading about Ruska Zhenska Vzaima Blagotvaritelne Obshestva, right, uh, of the 19th century, at the beginning of the 20th century. And it seems like the situation like there could, I mean, we can we can say that the situation is somehow um, like the the same. That's uh, you know, it's difficult to make political organizations. It's difficult to be involved in politics, but politics it appears in a different shape. For example. Uh, uh, either like uh, feminists who now they can't, for example, go to demonstrations, they can't do pickets, but they do educational initiatives and they uh, create these grassroots organizations for the enlightenment, right? How we call it for them spreading feminist ideas, feminist theory, all these kind of discussions. And I would say, yes, that uh, discussing the past of feminism, uh, the tradition we are like, young feminists and gender researchers belong to uh, they mm, feminists uh, in Russia they really mention uh, that are times but they also mention the dissident feminism for example I will show you just in a second um, um, this is the book which was published by those scholars I mentioned, Alexandra Talavir, but also Dmitry Kozlov and uh, Oksana Vasyakina. She's actually a feminist poet, but she's, uh, she's also interested in this, uh, I would say, in identity building when you try to understand you, the history of feminist thought in Russia and like to position yourself inside of this history. And this is the first, uh, the first republishing of the 
uh, Женщины и Россия, the feminist journal, which was created by dissident, uh, dissident feminists in the late 70s. And this, uh, this, uh, this book was published in a very small publishing house, Common Place, more like Samus Dad, I would say, than it. Uh, and uh, this book is the, uh, it uh, contains of this, uh, this almanac, this journal, but also the articles of uh, today's Russian feminists and, and at the same time gender researchers where they try to uh, describe uh, how they, what relationship they have to this journal, to this project, to dissident feminism. And is there a single tradition, a single line between this dissident feminism and contemporary Russian feminism. So this is, I will say, this is a part of the whole discussion about the identity which feminists today have in Russia. Yes. Yeah, I should say also that there, uh, the Association for Women in Slavic Studies, uh, which is uh, the major uh, organization in the United States devoted to gender studies in the former Soviet Union and Eastern and Central Europe uh, gave the Helt Prize to the translation of Natalia Pushkaryova's book, uh, The History of Women in Russia. So there, there is a connection and there has been a connection between uh, feminists and those interested in gender scholarship in the West and those in, the, uh, in Russia and the former Soviet, uh, former Soviet republics. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's tricky as you have mentioned. So uh, along those lines, I wanna get to the questions that have been put in the chat. Uh, the first one is, do you have any recommendations for international organizations who wanna support the rest, aside from AWSS, who want to support the Russian grassroots feminist organizations or activists without subjecting them to the risk of sanctions from the government? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a great question. And I feel that I really, I can't really talk about it uh, online because it's, it's a very sensitive topic. And uh, I would just propose, you can uh, write to me, for example, personally, uh, and I can just give you the context and discuss you, with you these kind of things uh, in private because it's just it's really dangerous. I mean, people can be called foreign agents in Russia, and they will be will have to pay fines. They will have to. Some of them are leaving after this happens to them. We have like, I don't know, fifty foreign agents, like individuals in Russia now. So th I would I would prefer not to discuss this kind of things online. But thank you very much for the question and for the uh, and that you that you want to uh, that you want to help that you want to uh, help these grassroots organizations yeah they really need this help actually they are vulnerable well actually along those lines uh some uh myra ferrer uh, writes in china a similar parallel development of an academic and new media feminism got seriously repressed with the arrest of the feminist five and now faces other arrests as well. Uh, so if you or other young scholars were actually in Russia now, rather than London, pa London Paris, or Vienna, would you be in jail now? No, I don't think that I will be in jail for my activities. We still, we, we still don't, uh, we're like far from this uh, kind of state of the regime, but we will face many problems. Uh, for example, I faced, uh, problems myself. Uh, uh, I had to leave the university where I worked, uh, but I also was involved in the trade union activism against the, um, the, pol the political persecutions against uh, Russian scholars, which we had in 2019, 2020. So yeah, for my activities, I really had to leave. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to be in London now because uh, for some time, I, I thought that I have no future in the research anymore. I have no, I will have no career. I will have no perspective uh, for development. Uh, so yeah, these limitations, they appear. You can face problems uh, on your work. Uh, 
you can on the workplace you can face problems in your family you can you can be fined for for example taking like for uh, taking part in demonstrations or some other activities and you can face the the police can come to your event like some days ago the um Alternativa, the Moscow organization of uh, socialist feminists they had their uh, meeting the closed one it was not their open event it was just their own like meeting of their members and the police came to their meeting which is kind of a new thing because before the police the police could come to the meetings but to the open events like open lectures festivals feminist uh, discussions all these kind of things but as for the events you have in your apartment i don't know it was not uh, it was not something which really happened and now now it happens uh, so yeah you can face many issues but you will not go to jail although we have some activists who are now um who can go to jail who are now uh under arrest for example the artist yulia Kutkova from komsomolsk na Amuri. she is uh, accused of uh, uh she had a blog about body positive with her own drawings kind of in this like primitive naive primitive style drawings of women's bodies and now she's accused of uh, creating and um, uh, posting online pornography which is a real crime in russia right so you can go to jail for this and so she was also accused of lgbt propaganda but it's not all about her blog actually she was making a theater in her town and she was uh, uh, making this theater for children and this uh, they were making plays about gender stereotypes or something like this so i think this was the main reason why the uh, why the police started attacking her because they thought that she's doing propaganda that she's uh, you know spoiling children like uh, uh, telling them them forbidden uh, like delivering them forbidden information and so on and so on so now yes yeah, she's under arrest and we had a big campaign in russia in her uh in her support but uh, i'm not sure what will happen next uh, how this case will finish yeah how, how it uh, will end so uh following up on on that um which sounds pretty horrible uh, um, we have a question, what role do LGBTQ plus issues and activists play in the Russian feminist movement, in the Russian feminist movements? I would say that LGBT plus agenda intersects with feminist agenda and many activists uh, uh, feel that way. We're actually intersectional feminism and intersectional perspective is quite popular in Russia now. It's something which is really discussed and many feminists call themselves intersectional feminists. So they are quite um, aware of the intersection of LGBT agenda, I don't know, migrant agenda, ethnicity, gender, how they all work together. And this is something which is really discussed. Uh, but I would also say that um, this law on the propaganda of um, LGBT, uh, of non-traditional values, which actually means mostly LGBT, uh, LGBT rights, uh, this affected feminism and uh, the fact that Yulia Tsvitkova, she was accused of uh, LGBT propaganda also affected the feminist movement. For example, on the 8th of March, the, in the previous, uh, year, I saw that some feminists who were trying to organize like meetings, demonstrations, this kind of things in their in their cities and towns, they were writing, "Please let's uh, let's concentrate on women's agenda, and uh, please don't uh, take their posters with the LGBT uh, agenda with like uh, with." Um, don't raise the LGBT agenda on this meeting because if you will do this, we will all go to the police, you know. Uh, so we would like to protect our members, uh, the, to protect the participants of the of the action. Please uh, let's uh, let's not touch the LGBT uh, rights 
agenda, let's concentrate on feminism. Uh, so yeah, this, this will also have, yes. So uh, there's a question about how do Russian feminist groups, and again, uh, I realize there are many diverse Russian feminist groups uh, view West, uh, Western movements, but also is just a, a, a quick question. Uh, is the word intersectional the same word in how is intersectional translated into Russian or it is, is it the same word used? Yeah, it's the same word as intersectionalny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so how do, is there, are, I'm sure there's a range of views about Western feminism. Could you, are there any general principles or general uh, views about Western feminism among Russian feminists or? I would say that now, maybe in the last two or three years, we have um, a big discussion about uh, feminism and how it intersects with post-colonial and decolonial agenda. And it's kind of, it's a little bit difficult because Russia, I mean, it was an empire for a long time. And I would say in many ways, it's still an empire uh, with many, with a lot of imperialistic sentiment. And feminists, they are discussing, first of all, how these uh, power relations, how they work inside of Russia. When, for example, feminist activists from Moscow and from St. Petersburg, they are really well known, you know, media wants to make interviews with them, uh, galleries invite them to have talks and so on and so on, but the grassroots activists from other cities, they are like in the shadow and this is this inequality, this um, uh, hierarchy really exists in Russia and this is something which bothers feminists from the different regions um, outside of our capitals, how we use them, because like, there are two capitals in Russia, right? Moscow and St. Petersburg. Uh, one is a cultural capital and the, another one is a like, real capital. So yeah, this, uh, this is discussed, but also what is discussed is that why we uh, speak about, when we speak about feminism, why we all the time refer to American authors, to Western tradition, and there is a big, uh, there is, there is a discussion that we must have our own tradition, that we must have, uh, what, that we must speak more about Russian authors. And <clears throat> for example, of the first uh, wave of feminism, but also this dissident uh, feminist authors and that they are rising, that there should be kind of decolonization of this all feminist thought, all feminist knowledge in Russia, because, uh, because now, yeah, like, uh, for a long time, Western feminism was kind of standard, like uh, icon, uh, which uh, and feminists tried to like, to copy it or to legitimize again their own ideas by saying that this is what is discussed on the West and this is important though. Uh, but now I would say that there is a turn to be at least more critical to this uh, to these uh, ideas and to these power relations between the West and other feminism. For example, uh, I know uh, I know one uh, feminist, Alexandra Piktimirova, she's from Kazan, Tatarstan, and she is advocating uh, Islam feminism. She is writing about it and she's saying that there's the whole this the whole Islam uh, women's uh, agenda before the Soviets came and uh, kind of destroyed it. So she's trying to unpack this and she's kind of writing a history of this uh, Islam, like Russian, Tatar, for example, Islam, feminism and how it could look like now. Yeah, so there are things like this. I mean, that was actually some of my writing was to say that there is this whole very uh, distinguished feminist tradition in Russia, which was repressed by the uh, one, after the, the uh, Bolshevik revolution. Uh, and so if it's being uncovered now or reevaluated, that would be in my mind anyway, a positive thing. So uh, I'm going to try to combine two uh, questions, uh, one from Elizabeth Wood and one from Janet 
Johnson, uh, Elizabeth asks, uh, how does the work by younger researchers differ from more academic gender studies and Western feminism? Are they inventing a new feminism? What is the effect of not being registered on their internal organizations? Uh, and uh, Janet is asking, uh, is there, uh, what is specific to this new kind of feminism in Russia? What makes it distinct from what came before and uh, what has happened in other places? What is the new thrust of this um, feminism? Thank you very much for your questions. I think not, uh, I can't answer all the questions because it, I think it needs more research. And uh, I mean, I started a project which I decided to call Artel, like, uh, you know, there was this women's Artels in the Tsarist times also. So this is a project of collecting and mapping Russian feminist movement today and Russian gender research. I have quite a lot of different materials, like, you know, zines in my personal kind of archive, personal collections, zines, publications, posters, arts, and all kinds of things. And I think that now it's time to kind of make it more organized and uh, make it like uh, make a uh, real archive out, out of it. So this uh, this is a big project which uh, I will have in the next I would think 10, 15 years of my life um, together with my colleagues and friends. And so I don't think I don't I can't say that much about the specificities of contemporary Russian feminism, but I would say that yes, first of all, uh, feminism became more open to other agendas like decolonial, postcolonial, intersectionality, uh, and it it tries it actually kind of advocates all kinds of discussions about violence and vulnerability in Russia. It seems like feminists, they are like trying to, they, they have to speak for all other groups also uh, who are vulnerable in Russia and they are those who are fighting the violent, the, cul the cultural violence in Russia. And this is like the main topic of contemporary Russian feminism that our society is very violent. It's like people are rude in everyday life. It's normal to be aggressive and uh, it is something which is praised even, uh, for example, you know this, that we say, if he hits you, that means he loves you, and this all kind of things. I mean, feminists, they are fighting against this world, this view, uh, this worldview, and this is a very important agenda, but also they are trying to connect, they are trying to, they are discussing how different kinds of vulnerabil vulnerabilities walk in, uh, uh, how they walk in Russia today and how they uh, intersect uh, with each other. I don't know if it's very new, if it makes this new feminist movement that unique comparing to others, but I think that that uh, at least that's what it makes, uh, that's what, like, it's, in, in, that's the main features of it. And of course, it's also very much an online movement. Um, so it's like there are many, there is a lot of online activism, online enlightenment, enlightenment activities. And again, I think that this we can say about activism worldwide today. It's not something really unique about Russian activism, but still, yes, we have it. Uh, and there is also a lot of critique that, you know, we're doing too much things online. We must go and start doing real things like building the crisis center or organizing demonstrations, though there are discussions about this. This is not something unproblematic for Russian feminists that they are so much concentrated in the, on the internet, in online um, space, right? Holy I mean, God. that could be self-protective too, given the nature of the state and how it uh, has responded to other kinds of protests. Uh, so I had this uh, kind of two uh, clarification questions. One of them is, uh, what is what does Bayram mean? B B A I R A M. What does that mean? What you know, 
I forgot. I'm so sorry. I forgot. I remember that there is a Femme Kislar, the Tatar organization, and Kislar means a girl, a young girl. So it's like feminist, a young girl feminist, but like the 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 mix of uh, uh, you know the feminist, the English word with a Tatar word. But as for the uh, Femme Bayram, which uh, it, it's a festival which takes part in Ufa. Uh, every year and sorry i forgot what this this word means it's not russian word uh elizabeth also asks uh, could you say something about doxa uh and uh, those student writers how are they doing and are they still under house arrest thank you very much for these questions doxa uh, is a student journal which was based, which was created in higher school of economics on the faculty of humanities, but then uh, it expanded. So now it has students from different Moscow universities and it was kicked out of higher school of economics. So they are not a student's organization anymore. And four editors of DOXA, uh, in this April, four editors of DOXA, they were arrested because during the Navalny protest they've made a video they've made a video when they in, in the video they were saying that it's illegal if a university or school threatens you uh, that they will kick you out uh, for the participation in the protests uh, so for this video uh, four editors of docs uh, they were accused of uh, we have this new law, we have so many new laws, you know, uh, we have this law about that you can't involve minors in the criminal activities, this kind of things. So they were accused that they were trying to involve minors in the criminal activities like uh, illegal demonstrating. And they are still under home arrest. It's, it's not called a home arrest, but it's, it's uh, practically a home arrest because they can leave homes only for two hours a day uh, from 8 to 10 o'clock in the morning. And yeah, this this case is still ongoing. Four editors are under home arrest. And the thing is that DOXA is a very interesting phenomenon because it's a leftist journal, uh, which was, um, it was created just as a student journal, but then they started advocating the rights of students and the rights of young people. And they also were writing quite a lot on about feminism and gender. Uh, I published some of my journalistic pieces in, um, uh, in DOXA, it's an online magazine, right? So, and also um, they are writing quite a lot about the problem of harassment in higher education and academia in Russia and about the relationship between students and professors, which like some time ago, like a few years ago, it was not a thing. It was not something which was discussed. It was just like, it was something which was really common and kind of part of the Russian academic culture, but it was not discussed. And DOXA one of, was one of the media which started to discuss these things out loud and write about them. So yeah, now uh, they are, they are persecuted for main uh, most active members. Or it's they have a horizontal editorship, so it's not they 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 don't have the main editor and like you know, other editors. They have the, all editors take part in a decision making, and four of my main active uh, the most active members are now uh, kind of switched off, uh, uh, like kind of switched off from the public uh, activities. So. Yeah, they are, uh, and they are still. It's still ongoing, so nothing have changed. Their home arrest was uh, is now until April, and we are not sure. They are, they are just good friends of mine. Uh, we are not sure when these people will be released, or, or will they be fined, or we will go to jail because the highest uh, sentence for this kind of crime is like, I, I sorry. Uh, I'm not sure about it. I don't remember exactly, but something like a year or two in a jail. And they are really young. So some of these people are still students, like Alla Gutnikova, she's 23, and she could not finish her undergrad studies because of this arrest. And uh, others also just, just graduated or... So yeah, this is, uh, this is the case we have now. Um, 
we're almost out of time. I, our audience has come to the rescue. Uh, Alexandra Navitskaya says that uh, the, Bayram means uh, festival in Bashkir and Tatar. Um, so sure. just to get back quickly, I think, uh, to the, what you mentioned at the end, uh, there's a question, sexual harassment seems to be the trigger that gets the Chinese government most upset. And uh, you mentioned that it's now becoming more of an openly discussed topic in Russia. And are there other hot topics like that that, uh, that I'm going to ask you to respond in one minute, <laughs> if you can. Um, so yeah, we have this um, uh, discussions about sexual harassment in academia, but also outside of it. And I would say that these discussions, they are highly problematic in Russia. I mean that uh, feminists, of course, promote these kind of topics and try to uh, make people more critical about power relations and how they work. And uh, um, and uh, but there is a huge reaction from more both intelligentsia and the state. And there is the whole discussion now in Russia about new ethics. I wrote about it a little bit for a Rido online magazine. It's uh, new ethics is a term which was created in Russia to name everything like feminism, anti-harassment uh, policies and anti-harassment movements, uh, LGBT rights, uh, new, uh, you know, BLM, right? Black Lives Matter, right? Uh, so all these kind of things, when minorities try to fight for their rights, uh, this is all called in Russia new ethics, and it is marked as something very bad, like you know people trying to like to use cancel culture again against everyone. They trying to shut up all other people for just small mistakes which they made in their lives. So there is a kind of a big discussion about this uh, in Russian media, at least in some segments of it, and. Uh, uh, yeah, so we have it. We have it. And it's, I think it's a long fight because um, there is no agreement about this kind of cases still. And today, for example, I, I saw news that a um, journalist from the Russian journal Holod, she wrote about a series of situations when one of the professors, St. Petersburg professors, she uh, was harassing students. He was, uh, he had affairs with them. He also made some illegal videos of these affairs without asking the students if they want this or not. And she, so she, the journalist wrote a, an article about this. And this, um, this person who is also a politician in the Yabloko party, by the way, it's like opposition party, right? Uh, he went to the court and now this journalist, uh, she, the decision was that she has to pay 300,000 rubles for this, uh, for this article to this person who even admitted on the internet that he did all these things. He even wrote on the internet. There was a very funny discussion that somebody was saying like, you, you were violent to this woman. There are so many, um, you know, there is so many eyewitnesses. And he said, I, I was not in violent to this woman. I can prove it because there was a camera in my apartment. I was like, you know, filming everything. So, and people were like, did you ask these people if you, they want to be filmed or not? So it's like he was quite open about all this, but he won the case. Uh, so he will get the money. So it's a long fight, I would say, for the feminist society. Well, Ella, I want to thank you very, very much for your presentation and for your answers to the many questions, uh, really great questions that were asked. Uh, I hope that we will see you again uh, on another Zoom talk, but thank you so, so much. And, and uh, I wish you well in your research and your activism and uh, just keep on doing it. Thank you very much for the invitation. It was